Good morning. We'll get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. John Ewell is the pastor of the Crown Center. He'll lead us in the invocation. I'm, on behalf of the community, I want to thank the, the Crown Center for the extraordinary efforts they went to after the tornado damage last year in South Oklahoma City. Actually held some of their services outside while um, uh, relief agencies used their, their building. So thank you for that, Pastor. And afterwards, I'll ask uh, Councilman Griner if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everybody please stand? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your grace, your goodness, your love, your mercy. Thank you for our mayor, our city council members whom you've chosen to give oversight to our city and its citizens. We bless each of them today, Lord. Pray that your grace, peace, and protection will rest upon them and their family as well. Thank you that according to Romans chapter 13, that these governing authorities are established by your will. They're your servants chosen and given a place of honor for the purpose of governing morally, ethically, and righteously so that we may live peaceful and godly lives. Grant them your grace today, we pray. Grant them courage to do the right thing, even when it isn't always the most popular thing to do. Grant them wisdom in making decisions regarding the affairs of our city that come before them today. And grant each council member physical, mental, and spiritual strength, enabling them to fulfill their God-given responsibilities as they continue to lead our great city. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, summertime is officially here. We thought an appropriate time to honor our Parks and Recreation Department, so I've asked several members of our Parks and Recreation Department staff to come forward. It is Park and Recreation Appreciation Month in the city of Oklahoma City. We have a proclamation. I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled up here. Whereas Parks and Recreation Programs are an integral part of communities throughout the United States, including Oklahoma City. Whereas our parks and recreation programs are vitally important to establish and maintaining the quality of life in our community, ensuring the health of citizens and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of our community. Whereas parks and recreation programs across the country build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and improve the mental and emotional health of citizens. Whereas parks and recreation programs increase the community's economic prosperity through increased property values, expansion of the local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction. Whereas parks and recreation areas are fundamental to the environmental well-being of our community. These areas help to improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve air quality, provide vegetative buffers to development, and produce habitats for wildlife. Whereas our parks and recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and recreate outdoors. Whereas the U.S. House of Representatives has designated July as Park and Recreation Month, and whereas Oklahoma City also recognizes the many benefits derived from parks and recreation resources. Now therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim July 2014 as Park and Recreation Month in Oklahoma City. Let's show our appreciation to our staff at the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, Doug, I was reminded this morning of some of the numbers, 153 parks, over 7,000 acres that our staff is responsible for. What can the citizens do to help you guys out? Well, the big thing is, is uh, we are your neighbors, and we want you to watch out for us as much as these folks that stand here with me watch out for your property. 
It's important to get outside. It's for our mental health. Uh, I join with the mayor and in his initiative to be a healthier community. I think the Parks and Recreation Department is the single biggest health provider in the city of Oklahoma City. So we want to thank you for your support along those lines. Get out and recreate. Absolutely, and we know we have. Um, if, um, uh, are there things that neighborhoods can do? What can neighborhood associations do to help out the Parks Department? Well, obviously anything that they can come out, uh, keep an eye out for vandalism. But if they are out walking the parks because we're putting in more and more uh, pathways, you know, take a litter bag along with you, help us out along those lines. Unfortunately, all of our fast food uh, uh, stores, it kind of gets away from people sometimes. So if you can just help us keep it clean, it'll make the environment a lot better. It won't wash into our streams and our river and things along those lines. Uh, if you can help these folks take care of the city, then uh, their job can go a lot faster and we can be more productive. We appreciate you all very much. Let's show our appreciation one more time. There you go. We are on item three of the council agenda. I'll look for a motion on the appointments. Comments or questions here? Can I ask a question just about the Northeast Renaissance Project? I haven't been part of putting together a TIF district. Reading through the, the retail incentives policy uh, in relation to the Cabela's, a lot of the language is, is directed at underserved area, creating a lot of the the incentives for the goals that have been expressed in terms of grocery stores and things that haven't been come to fruition. What, what is the, I guess, what is the purview or responsibilities of this committee? And then what are the, what are the reasons for going, the, I guess, the TIF route versus executing the language that's in the retail incentive policy? Or, or will they both be used? They potentially both could be used. Um, the TIF is, is uh, a property tax, it's, and the members are mostly representing the taxing agencies, the different taxing groups, school district libraries, the city county health, and such. Um, and so that is the property tax, and it, it, it'll, it'll freeze a level, and with that, a portion of that increment that grows beyond that will be used uh, to provide benefits to encourage development of that area. On top of that, there could be a sales tax tip for, for retail as you read the policy as we've done four times so i mean do you need do you need a tiff do we need a tiff yes we think that tiff is going to be critical to make that happen obviously there hasn't been much development in right. the area i was just talking to council and white if there's a place that probably needs a tiff to, to stimulate uh activity this is probably this is probably it but what what i guess are you looking for in the tiff that you wouldn't get from the retail incentive policy. I think policy. you're going to need both to make it happen. Okay. It's both. It is just. It's just two different ways to bring to bring dollars into a project. One's off a of sales tax. The other one's off a of property tax. Okay. So this committee does. What is their? It recommends allocations to the city council. It reviews projects and recommends allocations of fifth dollars to the city council. Okay. All right. Thanks. Do we get a motion on the appointments? And a second? All right, cast your votes. The appointments passed unanimously. We're on to item four. It's the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the journal for June 17th, and item 4B is to approve the journal for June 10th. Comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item five is request for uncontested continuances. Uh, outside of item 8-6, which was the uh, struck in child care ordinance. So if anybody's here for the child care ordinance, that has been, been struck. Um, moving to page 36, under items 
uh, 8H1, 8H1 on page 36. Item B, 1145 Carter Drive. Uh, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item F, 1334 Lafayette Drive. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item Q, 2236 Southwest 30th. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item S, 1933 Northwest 37th Street. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re notify a new owner. A new owner. Item U, 2625 Southwest 51st Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And item W, 900 Northwest 88th Street. We ask that that be stricken. Uh, again, the owner has secured. Any other requests for uncontested continuances? Or recess the council meeting convened as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Long list on the MFA today. Any comments or questions here? Mayor, I did just have one question, if I could, on item FAO. And um, this is the resolution approving uh, retainer agreements with uh, legal counsel that represent um, folks outside of the city. and. We have a list of qualified attorneys. I've met lots of them. They've done a great job. I just was curious when we delete or add folks to that list. For police officers, it's when the FOP asks for someone to be placed on the list or possibly deleted, although they've never done that. And other types of counsel, it's when there's an apparent need for it. But if somebody wanted to be included on this list of approved attorneys, um, do we do that via RFP or do we do that via contact to your office or how would that? Contact to us, but if they want to be able to represent police officers on those types of cases, they need to contact the FOP first. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Your, your Honor, I have a, yeah, Pat. a comment on uh, item uh, MFA, I think it's I.2. And this was an accident that involved a city attorney, and uh, the, the lady who had suffered the accident was pretty well banged up in this accident. And I was curious as to how an attorney uh, got that uh, kind of an accident. I found out that he was walking between meetings and tripped over a sign, uh, a caution sign or barricade sign downtown, fell and hurt herself. And that was the cause of the accident. I just like to say I had some curiosity as to how an office worker sustained these kind of injuries. Now, at first I thought maybe it was an irate client who came to talk to the lawyer. But no, she tripped and fell and hurt herself. And it was between meetings, so it was a working comp claim. Right. All right. Ready to vote the MFA? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OC MFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Second. We have a motion and a second. Comments on the PPA? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, just the claims and payroll today. Move the item. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. Move the item, subject to consideration. All right, we have a motion and a second on the consent docket. Is there any individual considerations from the council? Mayor, I'm sorry, I have a long list today. <laughs> this okay. is a big agenda. I'll try to be very brief, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things. All right, which ones? 6E. E. 6AO. 6AP. 6ATZ. And 6BM. All right, anybody else? Mr. Mayor, uh, 6D. 6BO. 6BP, 6BQ, 6BR. Uh, BK. Okay. All right, Meg, B, do you want to? Yeah, uh, BX, BZ, BS. BX, BC. I'm sorry, BZ, like zebra. Okay. Meg, you want to get started with item E? Sure. Let me see if I can just track all these down. Um, uh, item um, E is uh, our professional service agreement with Oklahoma City Metro Alliance, who 
I think as most folks know, run um, both the uh, public inebriate facility and our first step programs. And I just kind of wanted to remind everybody that one of the agreements that we made with the neighbors when we moved that facility was that nobody would leave um, by foot. And that um, if there wasn't somebody there to, to pick up um, someone who was exiting the facility that we would, uh, that they would provide taxi service. And there's a item in this budget, estimated cost of $25,000. So I really just wanted to emphasize, number one, that we don't let people leave that facility on foot. They must be picked up. We do provide taxi service, and there's a very healthy budget to do so. So we are fulfilling our responsibilities um, by uh, not allowing people to leave the facility on foot. And I know the neighbors really uh, were appreciative of that. Um, Item 8AO is our contract for health inspection services with the Oklahoma City County Health Department to perform inspections and event licenses. And um, I was just curious, Jim, how often we might, or if we have the opportunity to participate in that process of reviewing the regulations from time to time, and um, how we might do that. Um, those regulations, I mean, the ordinances are approved by council that they govern, that, that, that govern them. and so. This is, can you help me out on this? Uh, this is our annual agreement uh, for them to enforce some of our ordinance. I, I just heard some, kind, I, I heard a really anecdotal funny thing yesterday, but um, for all of the restaurants that are beginning to develop outdoors, we have outdoor terraces and the museum's rooftop and all, one of their regulations is, for instance, you can't open a bottle of wine outdoors. Well, that would be our ordinance. That, was, those would, be, that would be our regulation. If that is I thought it was City County Health Department. Well, but they, they, anyway. it would either, yeah, we can look at that and get back with I'm you. just curious about when we might, you know, if there's input, we might look at, as we look at every other ordinance, we might look at some of these because they seem pretty strange to me. Um, item 6AT2 is um, bike route improvements all over the city, and I just thought it was important for our biking enthusiasts to know that this is a uh, $362,000 worth of um, new uh, on-street bike route improvements all over the city of Oklahoma City for people to be able to get around. And I know we see a lot of folks uh, riding bikes uh, downtown, but um, this is citywide, and I thought it was um, a really impressive um, group of locations. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, the ordinance we have that requires uh, cars to be 36 inches away from bicycles at all times. Uh, could we uh, enact an ordinance, city ordinance, that requires bicycles to be 36 inches away from cars? <laughs> I, you know, I, there's an opportunity here for a, a, a ill-intentioned bicyclist mm -hmm. to cause a, 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 a violation of our ordinances by a driver who has no fault of his own. Yeah. And I just think if, if it's good for one, it ought to be good for the yeah, other. Yeah, no, if your point is they need to be looking out for each other, you're absolutely right. I, I yeah. think that's, that sure. would be helpful because yeah. there's been some instances where there's been two, a four-lane intersection where the two, two cars are waiting for light to change and a bicycle comes in between the two cars and goes across. And it, the, the bicyclist has put those drivers in violation of our ordinance. And I think we ought to have a similar ordinance to protect the drivers from bicyclists coming too close to them. It's, 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 it would give a, a, a bicyclist an opportunity to, to be aware of cars and cars be aware of bicyclists. I think it just helped both sides of the equation. But anyway, Meg brought up bicyclists, I thought. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, item 6AP are another list of professional service agreements. And I just wanted to mention again for our listeners how diverse this group of folks is and how much exciting development's going on around the city. And these agreements are with Friends of Northwest 10th Street, the Oklahoma City Hispanic Chamber, Old Capitol Hill Council, the Paseo Arts Association, Plaza District, the South Oklahoma City Chamber, Uptown 23rd Street Association, and the Windsor Area Business Group. All wonderful organizations that are putting a ton of energy into um, commercial revitalization districts and economic development efforts scattered all around the city, and so I just wanted to uh, recognize each of those organizations. 
And then the final thing is um, item 6BM, and that is our contract um, with Leadership Oklahoma City to run our youth leadership program, our youth council program. And I see Beth Short here, who is the director of Leadership Oklahoma City and helps us run that. I just wanted to once again recognize Mary Walsh, who is retiring, or has retired, um, as the director of our services agreement, and welcome. Beth, do you want to introduce the new Mary Walsh? We, uh, you said Mary 2.0, but. <laughs> I'm Beth Short. I'm pleased to introduce the mayor and the council. Uh, Amber Shelton, uh, Amber's coming tonight. She's the new public schools. She has lots of experience with young people. Um, she, she started on June 1st as the YLS director, but is also now working with uh, council staff, uh, staff member Jenny Martin for producing the youth council of Oklahoma City. So. Great. Well, we're really welcome. We're excited to welcome our new Youth Council, new youth council members, I think, in the next couple of weeks, and so we really look forward to working with you. And Amber, welcome aboard. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Sorry, that was a lot. All right, thank you for those comments, John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, item 6D deals with an agreement with Legal Aid uh, Services. A few months ago, Councilman uh, David Greenwell uh, brought up uh, the simple fact that he has some concerns whether or not um, people who could not afford legal representation when it comes to uh, zoning uh, cases. I think in the future we may want to uh, look into the possibility of uh, giving assistance to uh, individuals who cannot afford a legal representation when it comes to uh, zoning cases because a lot of times uh, the average Joe person uh, cannot afford uh, legal representation when it comes to uh, zoning cases and sometimes residents uh, they do not fully understand uh, the process uh, staff has done a marvelous job I believe in uh, explaining the process but I do believe that it's time for us to look into um, the concerns that uh, David um, brought up a few months ago uh, as it relates to 6BO and 6BP uh, this deals with uh, the GE uh, facility, uh, which uh, GE could have located anywhere throughout the United States, and they chose to locate in Oklahoma City, uh, and so and they chose to locate in Ward Seven. Uh, then um, PQ, P, excuse me, BQ and PR uh, deals with Baker Huge. Uh, and again, they could have decided to go somewhere else, but they decided to uh, stay within Oklahoma City and locate in Ward uh, 7. So I do want to thank the Alliance and everybody who was involved in the GE process and also Baker Huge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Uh, James? Yeah, item, item BK is, uh, is an agreement uh, with the Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation um, to operate the Route 66 Boathouse. I just wanted to highlight that that they're uh, that they're going to be doing a lot of improvements out there. Uh, it's really kind of taking the downtown boathouse district to the west side of the um, west side of the city, and it's a. I think Lake Overholzer is one of those sleeping uh, gems in the city that if you want to be kind of still outside recreation, um, but it be much more low key than coming downtown or going to Lake Hefner, then uh, it's it's kind of place for you but yeah. and Mike and op is here yeah um, so yeah it, it, it's really um, uh, a cool situation I think they're going to be ha having a, a putting in a zip line and a and a rock climbing walls and a lot of the similar things that are that are already downtown so it's, it's pretty cool Thanks. James how deep is that lake how deep is it yes. I have no idea <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's kind of, you know, how you have zero entry pools. This is kind of like one of those zero entry lakes. It, 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 you know, it's about 35, it's about 35 to 40 feet down on, on, on the, uh, along the dam, but then it, it, it actually tapers out to uh, very shallow up on the north well, side. Well, that's just my concern a little bit, is that if, if we're really, truly going to use this as a recreation facility, we might want to consider some dredging in there to lower the lake. We actually Increase have it. done some dredging up there. <laughs> yeah, most of the recreation is, is like I said, much more low key. You know, it's going out onto the dam. It's, uh, you know, there's two parks there. There's bike trails and things like that. So it's, uh, if you want to avoid crowds but still want to get outside and 
Yeah. Recreate around a lake, then that's a I like have kayak the canal place. over there. It really is <laughs> nice. I mean, there's basically no development that you're right. acting with. Right. Yeah. Pretty cool. Ed, you're up. B. X, let's see, BX is the Alliance for Economic Development contract. There's 100,000, which is just kind of a, a floating, non-allocated. Additional services for when things come up. Uh, this year we used some of that money to do a uh, land use study a little bit around the convention center. But it's, yes. So it's just open, I mean, it's just, we just allocate 100,000 and then it's. Then I uh, sign off on a scope of work that you can use that on. Okay, so it's a city manager signs off on we, I mean, work, not we, we work together and identify useful projects. Okay. BZ is the Oklahoma, Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust budget. I guess the, the question I have is the 900000 that gets transferred from the city's general fund to the Chamber of Commerce, what, 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 what are those funds used for? Those are also fund. That's the historic contract we've had for the economic uh, job creation uh, efforts that they do. That's the, the retail, the uh, Mike Ogan and, and uh, 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 his folks, uh, Kirk. Kirk Foreman, the, the people that do those type of efforts at the chamber. So that's in item CA, we're going to approve 6.65 .6 million for the chamber. That's just that's conventions, hotel, tourism, hotel. and visitation. That's hotel, mo motel tax. Right. Dollars that go up there. Right. So, not, so this is separate in, in addition to? That's correct. Okay. The, and how, how long have we been doing, how long has that contract been in place? CVB. Multiple. With the, for the, to transfer 900,000 from the general fund to the chamber. Well, for, it's, it, the scope has changed a little bit in time. Recently, within the last couple of years, we added a, a retail specialist down there. That they've had probably for, I don't know, four or five years. But uh, that contract's been in place um, Decades. Okay, at at a nine hundred thousand level. Oh, no. it, 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 the scope has changed over the years. They've they've done some special efforts. It's gone up. It's gone down, based upon their scope of work. Okay. Finally, these items BS, which is the Cabela's contract. I at Pat and Larry's invitation went to the Economic Development Trust meeting, listened to the corporate affairs uh, representative from Cabela's thirty-minute presentation. The item in front of the Economic Development Trust was. The incentive, the three and a half million dollar incentive. In the thirty-minute conversation, there was no conversation about the incentive. So, I, I left confused. There was no discussion. Um, we heard a boilerplate, generic presentation from Mr. Castillo that could have been in any of the dozens of cities in which they've extracted some five hundred and fifty million dollars in incentives from state and local governments. There was nothing specific about Oklahoma City. Why this is a good match. There was no request or explanation whatsoever of why they needed this three and a half million dollar incentive. This is a company whose CEO makes some three thousand dollars an hour, whose stock price has increased four hundred percent in the last five years, one thousand percent in the last six years, record profits, record expansion, no explanation whatsoever of why this three and a half million dollar incentive needed to be approved. And yet it was approved by the Economic Development Trust unanimously without discussion. There was uh, no discussion of how this fits with our retail incentive policy and what the implications are, which in my mind is opening the floodgates now for by stretching uh, the indications for this kind of incentive and making the case that this conforms with the with the 2008 City Council's retail incentive policy, that now you've opened the floodgates for basically any big box retailer. Any big box retailer is now going to qualify, and Costco or whoever's next, uh, there will be no argument to stop it. So it's more than three and a half million. You're opening the floodgates to, you're setting precedent with this. When I read the 2008 language, it's very clear the precedent is supposed to be given in particular to those projects which involve substantial investments in underserved or blighted areas of the city. There are five criteria which are supposed to increase the likelihood of providing incentives. Development of a brownfield site, of an urban infill site between existing structures, empty or derelict lots or buildings, underperforming or older suburban or commercial retail centers, and inner city neighborhood 
with little or no shopping retail development to serve local population, this obviously meets none of those five criteria. There are three, there are four regional retail project, a project that provides retail to an underserved area, and retail project located in a redevelopment area. This meets none of those three. The only possible area that, that this would qualify is a destination retail project. Of course, we're getting the 88,000 square foot version, not the larger destination uh, that you see in some of the larger cities. But our language reads that a destination retail project is a development that contains a retailer or a group of retailers who will offer a product and or good subject to sales tax, unique to the market, and otherwise not available for purchase at a retail business physically located in Oklahoma City. So things that are not subject to sales tax, like boats that will be sold at Cabela's, are not subject to the sales tax. We don't receive any of that sales tax, so you exclude that. So my question would be, what, what product would be at Cabela's that is not currently available for purchase at a retail business physically located in Oklahoma City? An enormous percentage of sales from this big box retailer will be guns. We clearly have that covered. Hunting. Uh, you, because you have a clothing line that you put Cabela's on the shirt, that does not qualify as a, a product uh, that's not available at a retail business physically located in Oklahoma City. Uh, and so I think that we are, we are dangerously stretching the indications for this. We're not uh, serving inner city neighborhoods or uh, underserved or blighted areas of the city. I think it's time to have some public meetings about incentives. There was a good article by Brianna Bailey this morning about uh, Chesapeake's uh, incentive and the lack of clawback provisions. I think we can do better. We can do better with our incentives. Other cities are getting more for their incentives. Uh, I think that we need public discussion about how we can do better with our incentive program. I think it's time to talk to our surrounding municipalities, maybe look at what Minneapolis has done. It's very frustrating to see Midwest City buying land in Oklahoma City to prevent us from building a Walmart and things like that. But as infuriating as that is, we need to sit down and talk with them and come up with a, a regional policy so that we're not all in a race to the bottom. Ed, in, in, in Minnesota, they share sales tax statewide, and that's why the municipalities don't compete with each other. And, I mean, and so then we're, that we're needs deal, to be... We're, we're playing the hands that were dealt. Right, I agree. So, so it needs to be on the legislative agenda, which I'm not sure it has been in the years uh, preceding. So put it on the legislative agenda, work with our legislators. I agree, work at the state level. Uh, otherwise, we're all going to be locked into a race to the bottom. Well, we do have one person that has signed up to speak, uh, Tom Adams. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I work for an outdoor equipment store called Backwoods at Tom, I, I will need your name and address for the record, please. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. My mistake by not letting you know. Okay. Um, Tom Adams, and it's uh, 122nd North May here in Oklahoma City. Um, the store I represent is uh, Backwoods. We've been in Oklahoma City for uh, 40 years. Uh, we've employed uh, 200 folks over those 40 years. Um, we feel like we're a valued member in the community. We've been involved very deeply with... Uh, uh, trail cleanups, uh, shore cleanups, uh, wildlife uh, department expo, um, all kinds of things uh, statewide as far as maintenance and things like that. Um, so instructionally, trying to get folks to go outside, we feel like we're a great uh, member, a part of that community. Um, we welcome the, the uh, competition with Backwoods, uh, uh, with Cabela's, I mean, coming to town. Um, it will bring for us a fresh opportunity to commit to, you know, better retailing skills and things like that. Um, I do think it'll bring awareness to outdoors. Um, I think it'll get folks to think about going outside. And I think the Parks and Recreation Department has done a great job with that. Um, as we move forward to the future, um, I would just encourage the, the council in general to not forget about the uh, smaller retailers that have been here for 40 years. And uh, we will continue to be here. Um, but we will recommit to help more in the city parks and things like that to get folks outside. But just a quick reminder to, uh, you know, don't forget us guys, we've been around here for a while, 
and thank you for the opportunity. Remind us where, where your store is located. Uh, it's 122nd and North May, so we are just within two miles of the uh, proposed uh, construction area. So, All right. Well, thank thanks you. for coming. You guys back. do right. a really great job. I was up there just thank recently you. getting some hiking boots, and they did a fantastic job helping. Thank you very much. About what I, we needed to do, where we were going, and um, it was really personal and appreciated. Well, we have a real joy and a real passion for what we do. Thank you. They also have a really nice uh, walking sticks that fold up very, so you can put them in your suitcase and take them out when you get to your business. Thank you for saying. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? I, I, on, on, that, on that point, I think that um, uh, our retail investment policy, if anything, um, I think it's pretty well written, how, how it's written. Uh, I think if, if there's something that it may be missing within the policy is uh, how to address um, basically what he just said, the cannibalization of existing, uh, of existing retailers. If there's some way that we can address that, be it through some way of showing only incentivizing new, uh, you know, out of, out of our market um, sales, you know, through zip code, uh, through a certain percentage, you know, of how much, say in this case, like Cabela's is saying that they're going to have a certain percentage that's going to be cannibalization. We're saying there's another percentage and somewhere in between, meet somewhere in between. Somehow, somehow just incentivize the new, because, you know. I, I think it, that is worked into our math, James. Is it? I mean, yeah, it's, there's, a, there's an effort there to, to judge well, I, the cannibalization and try to see what is new to the city and what is not. I think it probably is in, in our math of coming up with the 3.5 and the 1.2%. I think that that is, it is worked in there, but I think it's not spelled out how that math works in our investment, in our retail policy. And I think that that probably needs to be, so, so we're kind of clear on, on where we stand on it. We'd be happy to look at that. Of course, one of the other benefits with, with Cabela's is they have a strong uh, catalog side of their books that is not paying internet sales that are not paying uh, sales tax now and with them coming in, that'll be bringing the sales tax to that That's true. area also. But yes, that's a great point. We'll be able to look into that. All right. Ready to vote the consent docket? Well, if we can vote on BS uh, separately. Okay. Is it just BS? Is that the only one we need to pull? Okay. So we have a motion appropriately <laughs> labeled. We have, we have a motion on the consent docket. I'll uh, uh, take that motion to exclude BS and we'll vote on that separately. All right. <laughs> Cast your votes on the consent docket minus that one item and it passes unanimously. And then how about a, a motion BS. <laughs> BS, is, BS is seconded. Cast your votes and it passes eight to one. All right, on to the concurrence docket. Uh, the Subject to individual consideration. All right, comments or questions on the concurrence? All right, cast your votes. It, uh, Ed, the concurrence docket yeah. passes unanimously. And we're on to item eight. These are items that require a separate vote. We start with a series of zoning cases. The first is in Ward 8. It's an ABC issue at 2300 West Memorial Road. Uh, Pat? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Francis, did anybody sign up to speak on this one? This was approved by the, the Planning Commission, and it is an ABC application in an area of similar operations, and I think uh, we ought to go ahead and approve it. I move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8A1. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A2 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 1404 Southeast 20th Street. It's currently R1 single family residential and it would become an I2 moderate industrial district. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Madam Clerk, has anybody signed up? Is the applicant present? Can you please briefly um, explain? Hello, my name is Darren Snow. I, uh, I reside in Mustang. I'm the representative for the company that's, that's doing this. Basically, uh, the building they have, they've outgrown it. They need to expand and they cannot expand the building. Although they own the property, they can't expand onto that R1 until it is changed over. So they just want to change that strip. There's no home or anything there, it's empty land. They just want to change it over to I2 so they can expand that building about it's going to be in the neighborhood of 2,800 square feet or so. 
All right, thank you. I had a chance to drive by there over the weekend. I move for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8A2. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A3 is a zoning case in Ward 8 at 19800 North May. It's currently R1 single family and it would become a new R1ZL single family zero lot nine district. Pat? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Francis, anybody sign up? To take there were no uh, protesters present. Is the applicant here? Applicant's representative is here. Would you like to say a few words, David? Uh, I'll give you a basis to charge your client. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. This is a, uh, an application up on North May, and we're going from uh, R1 to R1ZL, which is consistent with the zoning uh, immediately to the east. It's part of a, a larger overall project that my client owns, and it's just the, uh, the next piece uh, in the puzzle. There were no protesters at the Planning Commission, and they did recommend approval. Thank you, David. Are there any questions for David? Hearing none, I move approval. Second. All right, we're voting on item 8A3. Cast your votes. It passed you. unanimously. Item 8A4 is a zoning case in Ward 3 at 4606 South MacArthur Boulevard. Larry? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Has anybody signed up to speak on this? No. This was approved by the Planning Commission. There's a little plot of land out there surrounded by I-2 uh, that is currently zoned R1, and this brings it in conformance with the rest of the properties in the area. So I move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 8A4. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8A5 is a zoning case in Ward 4 at 5400 South Anderson Road. It's currently AA Agricultural and also an Airport Environs District, and it would become a new plan unit development. Pete? Is the applicant present? Um, are there any protesters present? Uh, the, um, are you, you've agreed to the technical evaluations that are on the that were recommended by the, by the Planning Commission? I'm sorry, Mr. Quiet. There's a, there were technical, uh, the Planning Commission approval was subject to the technical evaluation. You've, yeah. you've agreed to all those? Yes, if, if need, uh, technical, yes, I will. Um, Blood. I move approval. All right, we're voting on Your item 8A5. Eight eight on yeah. these kind of structures, we've had several complaints about their appearances. So I would encourage the developer to make it as attractive as possible within your uh, Yes, sir. We have, uh, we have taken some extra precautions for the exposed side to Anderson Road so the, where people drive by. We're okay, going to do, do some extra on that. Yes, sir. All right. Cast your vote. And it passed unanimously. Item 8B is a zoning case in Ward 6. The address is 730 Northwest 23rd Street. Meg, this is yes. an ABC issue. It is, Mayor. Thank you. And I expect we've had a couple people sign up to. Yeah, uh, we have on three this. people that have signed up. I believe the applicants are here, so maybe they'd make a brief presentation um, about the business business plan and business model, and then we'll hear from anybody else. Okay. And guys, we we need your name and address for the All record, right. as we had before. Good morning, City Council. My name is Jared Friedel. I live at 4525 North Georgia Avenue. I'm here with my partner, Wayne Allen, and we are the owner-operators of Gaiudis. Gaiudis will be located on the southeast corner of Northwest 23rd and Chartel. We are currently under construction, renovating a vacant building into a thriving restaurant. We are here today to seeking approval for an ABC2 overlay. Gaiudis is a full-service restaurant and rooftop patio serving an eclectic blend of fresh, healthy, plated entrees. Our tentative plan is to be open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. The urban core currently has few to no healthy options for late night food and our business model is poised to change that. Not everyone works eight to five. People attend activities downtown, Thunder Games, Civic Center events or concerts. When they get out, they want to go get something to eat. And currently we have few choices other than fast food for late night service. We've done extensive research and feel like this is a largely ignored need in Oklahoma City. The city needs a nice place where people can go eat after 10 p.m to get a nice glass of wine and a healthy meal. Gaudis wants to provide that. Wayne and I grew up in the Oklahoma City area. We are Oklahoma born and bred entrepreneurs. We have been working on the concept of Gaudis for over six years now and have owned the property for over three. We have invested close to $1 million in this adventure. This is our lifelong dream. We want to have a positive impact on the community, provide a needed service and be a good neighbor. We are very sensitive to our neighbors' concerns. We have secured a parking lease agreement with Clinica Guadalapana for 30 to 50 spaces 
and we'll be installing signage to notify our customers where to park. We have conducted rooftop sound tests, which showed sound levels from the rooftop to be a non-issue. Of course, we will comply strictly with the noise ordinances, but just to be sure, we have added additional structures to our architectural and structural building design that will provide walls on our rooftop patio to provide extra sound barriers. Although we are located on 23rd Street, we realize we are also a part of the neighborhood. We have demonstrated that any concerns our neighbors have will be taken seriously and we will work tirelessly to resolve those concerns. We want to be a positive addition to the area. We plan to display local art as part of our interior design and plan to contact local high schools and Oklahoma City University to collaborate on getting up and coming artists work on display. To be truly successful, we want to be accepted by the community and for them to be happy to have us here. Just as many restaurants in the Uptown 23rd Street District have applied and been accepted for the ABC2 overlay, your approval of our request is crucial in allowing us to be competitive with other businesses in the same type in this area and provide the vision that we have for Gaudi's. Thank you for your time and consideration. And if you have any questions or concerns, uh, we would love to answer them. We have a sample menu that we'd like to pass around. Great. Thank you very much for coming down. Does anybody have any questions? I just like to make a comment, Your Honor. I think the rebirth of 23rd Street is really encouraging. And I think anything we can do to defer that by approving this application, I mean, really takes pride in it. the fact that 23rd Street is becoming a, a pleasant place to go again. It wasn't a while. I think um, the application here uh, was everybody can see was recommended for denial uh, by the planning department. Um, but I've been working on this for now a couple of months, and I believe the reason it was recommended was there was a suggestion that a, a SPUD might be um, a better way to do this, to potentially restrict your weekday more than anything hours. Right. And, um, you know, I just want to be clear that, you know, I think the business model is a very valid one. I do believe there's a need for late night dining, and you have assured me, and I want to do so on the record, that this is not designed to be a bar. Absolutely not. But it's designed to be a full service restaurant that actually, you know, where you could get a glass of wine or a cocktail if you wanted to. Um, you've also assured me that the market will drive the hours. Yes. And so, you know, if for some reason this business model isn't correct and there aren't people there late at night, you won't stay open no. until 2 o'clock in the morning just to do so. Right. Um, you know, I think it's also important to note that all the other restaurants along 23rd Street that have ABC licenses all can be open until 2 o'clock. They just choose not to. But to require that one restaurant have a spud and all the rest of the businesses not have one, I think puts this business at a competitive disadvantage and potentially impacts the long-term value of your property. Yes. Um, so given all of those, I, I mean, I'm very pleased that you went ahead and leased the parking spaces. Parking is an issue, right. and your neighbors are going to be concerned about parking on the side streets. They're also going to be concerned about noise. But we do have, I mean, appreciate the fact that you went to the trouble to have the noise test done. Appreciate the fact that you've built walls around the outside. And we do have um, noise ordinances in place that if this becomes a problem, we will be able to react to it regardless of whether or not there's a spud in place. So I think we have all the controls we need to to deal with it if it becomes a nuisance. And so I would move approval um, of this application. All right, we have a motion and a second. We have some people, though, that have signed up to speak. Why don't you guys sit down? If we have any more questions, we'll bring you back up. Um, I'll ask the people that have signed up to speak to keep their comments to three minutes or less. Amanda Putnam. And Amanda, we will need your name and address for the record, please. Sure. Amanda Putnam. I'm a resident of Mesta Park, 17th Street. I'm just here to say that I support it. You know, right now there is a dilapidated, uh, abandoned building there that is an eyesore to the entire neighborhood. This is something fresh, innovative, exciting. And even though most people might think that uh, only late night people would be eating there, I can't tell you how many sporting events I have with little kids that we come out and it's nine o'clock and there's not a lot of options, even for us. You know, so it would be nice to be able to go someplace that is near my house, uh, eat there, and then head on home. So I'm just in support of it, and as a Mesta Park resident, I wanted to make that evident to everybody. Thank right. you. Thanks for coming down. David DeWitt.
Good morning, Council. I'm David D. Witt. I reside at 901 Northwest 22nd Street, Ward 6, 73106. I'm speaking on behalf of the Mesta Park Neighborhood Association Board. And Mesta Park, is, or about our contents are 22nd Street, the 200 to 1,000 block, and the 400, sorry, the 500 to 1,000 block of 16th to 21st Street. We are very, very excited for Gallutas to come in and redevelop this building into a, a new attraction that all the residents and other visitors to the district can enjoy. We give our full support to Gallutas developing this, and we are excited for their outdoor patio. Uh, I think it would be a, some fresh variety for the street. While we're in such strong support of Gallutas, I'm here today to give our support for the Planning Commission. We support the Planning Commission on how they've made their decision on how to process this application and they've chosen, chosen the SPUD. We trust that the Planning Commission has the experience, the resources, and the foresight necessary to permit this development with an excellent balance of encouraging economic development and the consideration that the building is adjacent to the neighborhood. And on the long-term front, you know, we, we are thinking about not Gayutas, but their successor companies and how the building floor print may change in the future and the only purview or the only purview will be under will be the urban design commission and we feel like that the planning commission might be better equipped to balance the, the needs and interests of the neighborhood and businesses separated only by a 10-foot alley okay. thanks david thank you mm -hmm. ben sellers My name is Ben Sellers, 1724 Oaks Way, Oklahoma City. Uh, I'm here representing the Uptown 23rd District Association as the current Vice President, and I um, just wanted to distribute uh, a letter from the officers of Uptown 23rd District Association in support of the Coyotes Project and their ABC2 alcohol overlay. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second for approval. Is there any other just comments or questions? Just yeah. one. I would just ask the owners for your help um, and partnering. You know, this is the first year that we're looking at having nighttime public transit in Oklahoma City, and it will be along your street. And I would ask your help to help us grow that line. If there's ways that for your customers at night that have, that have been drinking, um, if you could let them know about public transit, if you could let your employees know about public transit. There was another study that came out this week damaging about you know, the severity of drinking and driving in Oklahoma. And so I would just, I would ask if we could partner and help build that uh, transit line. We will do that. We have a drunk driving uh, program or designated driver program um, in our business plan to uh, give discounts to the designated driver and then a gift card for the next time they come back. So Great. we can hopefully stop all driving, and we do have a bus stop directly outside. We're going to promote biking. We're going to, we're trying to make this as safe as possible. All right. I mean, maybe for your OCU students, for those yes. along 23rd that can just take it from your restaurant to their home. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Pete, <clears throat> I, I'm um, I'm in favor of this uh, today, but I think the the gentleman from the uh, neighborhood association raises an interesting point that maybe that's something we shouldn't look at, at in the future at a workshop or something with regard to uh, um, uh, regard to the current thinking at the Planning Commission is to um, is very much in approval of what I consider contract zoning, which is a spud, where you say exactly what you're going to do and you can't do anything else but that. Um, that, that is, very, for, for the short term, that's, very, that's a very good idea. For the long term, as Meg points out, over the long term, it decreases the value of that real estate and, and it changes the character of it over the long term. It seems to me that maybe that we want to go there, maybe we don't want to go there. But I think this case points that out probably as well as any that I've seen recently. And that we are, I would like to think about it um, <clears throat> as a topic, at least on one of the workshops this summer, that we would just kind of review that whole idea because uh, it, there are there are good things and bad things about contract zoning. I mean, and I just think it's maybe given the given what I've listened to the arguments at the Planning Commission on several cases recently, and it, there appears to be a strong attitude favoring 
contract zoning. And, uh, and maybe that's a wave of the future, but I think this case points out that it might be well to look at it, to look at how, what we do in the future, whether or not we are going to require people. This case has got some interesting pieces to it, like everybody else doesn't have it, as, as, uh, as Meg pointed out. But that's happening not just in cases like this. It's happening in, <clears throat> in areas all over the city. And I, I, if that's what we want, that's fine. <clears throat> but it seems to me it's a policy decision and that policy should start here rather than at the planning commission. And I would just like to see a, the whole idea vetted at some point at a workshop this summer. We're going to have two or three, I suppose, and we, some of them are kind of open-ended on policy. I just would like to see that added to this. I'm going to vote for this. I think this is a good idea. It's, it's, it doesn't fit exactly, but it brings the it crystallizes the argument very well as to whether you ought to have contract zoning or, or not. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Cast your votes on item 8B. Passed unanimously. Item 8C has been struck. Item 8D is an item that would bring our retirement plan up to IRS code. It's being introduced today, and Renee Hutton is here. Yes, this ordinance, ordinance amendment is changing the actuarial assumptions that our actuary uses based upon life expectancies. The IRS has increased life expectancies based upon national data, and so our actuary will be using those in determining what the values of the liabilities are for the ochres. We use that our latest evaluation, and it put us at 101%. The ordinance will provide that we will use these longer life expectancies when we calculate joint survivor annuities, which are uh, reductions in benefits that the employees pay to provide benefits to their spouses. So we're increasing the life expectancy and having to increase the, the length of time we think we may be paying benefits? That's correct. Right, the actuary is using that in their calculations to determine, and we, and we use that in their latest evaluation, and we're still at 101 percent. Yeah, it's, it's really, I think that's a great point, because ultimately that will, that will have a negative impact on, on the funding level or, or, of the retirement system, but right now the latest numbers just came out, and we are funded at 101 percent. Okay, thanks. So this item just being introduced today, how about a motion to move it forward? Yeah. Cast your votes. Item passes, and we've set a public hearing for this item July 15th. Item 8E is the latest on the Urban Ag Ordinance, and Aubrey's here from the Planning Department. Good morning. Um, this item is coming back and making a correction. As you'll remember, when we introduced the Urban Agriculture and um, urban chicken ordinance as one package, uh, council asked for us to separate those two items apart. In that process, there was a provision that established the minimum size of the parcel that would be allowable that was meant to attach to the urban chicken piece that was inadvertently left in the urban agriculture amendment. So once we realized that this happened, we um, put this on the agenda to uh, put it back the way that it originally was and now there's a provision in there so that any um, cases where there were chickens allowed on parcels less than one acre would be considered non-compliant until the effective date should you adopt this ordinance. And then at that time, in three months, they would have to come into compliance with the code. So I'm here to answer any questions if you have them. I have, I have a quick question. Does this ordinance provide for chickens? Pardon? Does this ordinance provide for chickens? No, this resets how it used to be and that they can only be allowed on acreages or on acre. larger. Thank you. Any other comments or questions this item being introduced today? But it, tell me again why 1.0 acres is the cutoff. We, we really don't know when that size was established. My theory is that because most agricultural and rural agricultural parcels, it's the threshold between urban and rural in the zoning code, that that was meant to put livestock and those uses that were allowed to agricultural areas versus urban areas. That's my theory, but I think that this has been established as one acre for as long as I've been here. Is it fair to say that it's somewhat arbitrary or completely arbitrary? I think any establishment of a zoning size or threshold is up to each municipality to figure out, but I think standard agricultural um, minimums are usually around one to two acres in most communities. But there are guidelines on a lot of zoning 
regulations, and we drew the line here between residential zoning and and uh, our agricultural or our RAs right. uh, lines. And so it it isn't. We, we say it's okay to have chickens in these zoning uh, districts, but not these zoning districts. It isn't really the one acre. It's more that these zoning districts allow it, and these zoning districts do not allow it. So as as I tried to move this forward with a permit process, but was opposed to um, citywide um, chicken raising on less than an acre, I'm going to move approval of this or move it forward. Yeah. Second. Is there a second? All right, we're moving this forward. And again, there'll be a public hearing this item July 15th. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8F, we'll be selling some gold bonds. This item just be introduced today. Is there a motion? Move the item. Second. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And then there will also be a hearing on item 8F on July 15th. Item 8G is a series of dilapidated structures that are up for consideration today by the council. This is a public hearing. Did anyone show up today hoping to speak on any item listed under 8G? All right, how about a motion? Move the item. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8H is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 8H? All right, how about a motion? Move the item. So, uh, I have a sure. real yeah. quick question. Uh -huh. Have we uh, determined yet what um, we're going to do with the extra manpower that's in the budget uh, uh, that was for the vacant buildings? No, we're, uh, our staff is meeting with the municipal council's office and, and, and planning and neighborhood services and city manager's office is meeting today to come up with, with, with a, or not today, uh, we have been meeting off and on to come up with a new plan that we're, we're bringing back to council. Okay. Okay. So we, we're, we're getting close to some recommendations on okay. how that would be. I hope it's more code enforcement. I, that's I that's my that, hope. I think that's the general direction we're going. Okay. In. All right. We're voting on 8H. It passed unanimously. Item 8I is a public hearing regarding some grant dollars that are coming to us through the Department of Commerce. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on item 8I today? It is a public hearing. All right, how about a motion? Move the item. Steve Rhodes might just hi highlight this is actually a, a, a significant uh, opportunity for us to, to get some, some uh, CBDG dollars that are allocated for disasters, and uh, we're able to capitalize that, and he's got a, a list of, of projects that those would be used for, and I think Steve can, can highlight those projects. Yeah, uh, December 16th, uh, the HUD secretary, or there's a federal register notice published where the HUD secretary allocated $10.6 million to the Oklahoma Department of Commerce to aid in the long-term recovery of those areas affected by the May 20th and May 31st uh, tornadoes and severe uh, storms and flooding. Um, working with kind of a interdepartmental uh, group of uh, employees, uh, of, of city uh, staff, we identified, well, the Federal Register notices they have a, a wide range of different criteria that they had to allocate resources to a certain amount of money has to be spent in Cleveland County all of the money has to be spent under community development block grant regulations as they may be amended by the different federal register notices this committee of city staff members was able to identify a, a bundle of projects that kind of met all of the different criteria that were set aside in the actually four separate federal register notices that uh, pertain to the Hurricane Sandy Disaster Relief Act. Um, some of the projects that we're going to fund is about 10, or excuse me, about three miles of arterial streets that were damaged by the, the debris removal process, specifically Penn, uh, between 134th and, and 149th Street. 149th Street, essentially from uh, I-44 over to May Avenue, and uh, 134th Street from Sunny Lane to Sooner Road. Those would be the streets that meet under the Community Element Block Grant Program's urgent need category of, of uh, national objective. We'll also replace sidewalks and trees that were damaged uh, through that process. In addition to me, that's to a significant project because, because of the impact down there with the cleanup material and the new construction the trucks that come down there, some of those streets have, you know, if you just drive to neighborhoods that are not impacted, those streets are, are really in tough, tough conditions. It's essentially $2.7 million that will be allocated to that activity, to also to help meet the Cleveland County set-aside. 
Oklahoma County was more impacted by flooding as well as wind damage. And uh, one of the projects that we are going to fund is some drainage improvements on South uh, Walker between Southwest 29th to the river. Uh, again, an area that is, you know, subject to, you know, severe repetitive flood loss. And uh, we've allocated about $2 million, a little over $2 million to address that activity. Again, the program has to meet block grant requirements, so we have to meet a low mod national objective with 50% of the resources. That project would qualify to meet that low mod national objective. In addition to that, we will be conducting a housing rehabilitation program and a safe room program to uh, address the housing needs for low and moderate income persons. Uh, obviously, to help resiliency and sustainability uh, through, through a, a you know, future uh, disasters. That's about 1.7 million. We will do one multifamily project. We were required to survey all the HUD-assisted properties, and we had one project that, that uh, filtered up that was eligible, damaged by the storm, and that's Providence Apartments. It's included in the application packet as well. Block grant program allows you to use a certain amount of money for planning activities, and we will do some preliminary engineering and planning for uh, those uh, street improvements and uh, utility improvements, as well as to start a, a master drainage plan for the community. Initially, we'll look at the downtown area, and we will be uh, looking at future projects because on June 3rd, a second, or a, excuse me, a, a fifth uh, federal register notice was published allocating an additional $83.1 million to the state, and we will be looking at projects to, to include in an application process for the additional resources. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. We're ready to vote on item 8I. Okay, cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Item 8J is a couple of revocable right-of-way permits. The first is from the Triathlon Club of Oklahoma City, who plan to hold the Dew Draper Twice Duathlon on July 12th and 13th at Lake Stanley Draper. Is there anyone here representing this organization? All right. How about a motion, Pete? It's in Ward 4. Okay. Cast your votes, and it passed unanimously. And on an 8J2 is a request from Western Enterprises to hold a fireworks display uh, in downtown Oklahoma City in Ward 7. John, you okay with this? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I encourage those who would like to uh, see some great fireworks, please come down downtown uh, on July the 4th. Uh, I move for approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there anyone here representing this organization? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8K um, would extend our line of credit in um, Tisch District 2 and 3. And uh, Brent Bryant is here, um, I guess. Okay, Craig's going to take it. Yeah. All right, Craig, can you tell us more yeah. about item 8K? So I'll, I'll speak to item 8K and L, if that's okay. These okay. are both extensions of lines of credit associated with the TIF districts, as the mayor said, that the first one on item K is the extension of the uh, variable rate line of credit for the downtown TIF and it's TIFs two and three. So it'll extend it for another year. These are variable rate lines of credit that allow us more flexibility and when we borrow and pay down the principal, it gives us a very favorable rate and um, has worked to, to our advantage to be able to manage this loan this way. This one was approved first in March of 2014. It's a $10 million line of credit. Nothing's been drawn upon that as of this time, but the plan is, the expectation is with projects that are in the works that over the next 12 months, this will be drawn upon. This is something we bring back to the council each year. Um, item L actually is for the Dell TIF, and that's TIFs four and five, and it is now, it's putting the maximum at $8 million. Currently, the principal's at about $6 million, and again, this is another one where we're managing this TIF renew this rate annually and bring this back to the council and we have to answer any questions. I think it's important, it's important to point out that the Dell TIF is, we've, we've paid off a lot of principal on that over the years. Right, it was at 16 million at one time, we're now down to $6 million. Okay, all right, I'll take that a motion and a second on item 8K. I just want to ask yeah, one sure. question about TIF 2. I, I think this is on the consent docket, and I'm, but we're changing TIF 2, the, the amount for hotel, from 30 to 45 million, that. I can bring a better answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Um, that is actually a commercial. The, the category is hotel and commercial. 
we're starting to see more um, projects that are related to the commercial uh, ranks instead of, uh, and so what we're doing is we see projects coming forth in the, ne in the near future, and we were looking for just to increase the uh, budget category for that. So when TIF 2 was set up, there was an overall budget for it, and some of that money was into, into different categories. One of those categories was money back to the taxing agencies, and that's one. Mr. Lopez is here this morning. We've got some money off a different TIF, but going to the, one of the taxing agencies, we had it in for a lot of money was going in, in, into uh, uh, residential, uh, but we also had commercial and retail. So we're, we're not changing the, the, the size of the budget. We're just changing the allocations thereof. So we're dropping retail? So now Are it's hotel and... No, we're actually increasing uh, the, the items... Because of the growth. <laughs> we're actually um, introducing that today. Uh, we're going to increase the um, overall budget um, significantly. It goes from 93 and a half, I believe, to $126 million. And uh, we're adding it to taxing other taxing jurisdictions. We're adding it to uh, public schools. We're adding it to housing. I think we added $5 million to housing and then the $15 million for commercial and hotels. And that's just kind of the category. Initially, it was hotels, retail, commercial. Uh, we, we're striking the, the, the plan is to strike the retail and focus on hotel and commercial. Right now, all the projects that we're working on are, are commercial, which are office type buildings. Can you, could you use that 15 million for the convention center hotel? Uh, there would be potential for that, yes. Okay. Okay, we're voting on item 8K. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And how about a vote or a motion on item 8L? All right, cast your votes here. And it passes unanimously as well. Item 8M uh, shows that Maps for Kids is moving along and uh, we're preparing to finish it up. This uh, would be an allocation on, on, the, um, uh, on the, the TIF plan. For, um, this is TIF too, isn't it? For, this is for the administration project. This was originally allocated a few years ago for the, uh, an attempt to, to purchase the, the uh, Old Central High School for the administration buildings. And, there was a, a competition for that, and Oklahoma City Law School prevailed, and so that's where that will be going. So we had that allocation. So we're simply changing that allocation from uh, the school district's use of it for that building to their uh, new headquarters, which will be uh, between 5th and 6th on, uh, on be between uh, Classen and Western. So it's in a different TIF district than it was? No, it's, it's in the same TIF district. It's just it was site-specific on the first We have to redo the language right. because of the site. Okay. <laughs> All right, cast your votes on item 8M, and it passed unanimously. And item 8N is a TIF allocation in Ward 4, Capitol Hill Library. Pete, you want to speak on this? Um, what can I say? It's a good, <laughs> it's a good use of, of the money, it really is. That, that library expansion is probably 25 years past due. And it's, it's, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this, and I move the resolution. Second, and right. I would just like to add that particular library is uh, utilized to its full capacity right now. They, uh, I sp spoke with uh, Donna Morse, the director of the library uh, commission, and uh, they are certainly uh, got great plans for the facility, and, and I know the children in that area are really going to benefit from that, as well as all people, not just children. All right, we're voting on item 8N, and it passed unanimously. Item 8O is a resolution which would approve some policy amendments to our housing program. Bob Daly is here to hit the highlights on that. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Bob Daly, I'm the Housing Rehab Coordinator. We had the new home rule come out uh, this year, beginning July 1, and we have to deal with the changes in the regulations. Part of that, we had to have a policy for lead-based paint and as well a policy for our rehab to be in compliance with that rule. Yeah. One of the most significant changes to the policy was the limit that we could spend on a rehab. We're limited now, 95% uh, of the area medium income price of $126,000 for a rehab. And of course we updated the income limits and raised our hemp expenditure limits from 14,000 to 18,000. And in addition to that, we had to we made a change from our previous operations for our home exterior maintenance programs. We used to bid those out 
with community action. We no longer bid those out. We bid them out individually and the homeowner selects contractor to do that work. So it makes it a lot easier to keep it in house and manage the program. Okay. Any comments or questions for Bob? How about a motion then? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thanks, Bob. Item 8P comes to us from the Parks Commission. This would rename a portion of Civic Center Park uh, in honor of Frank J. Hightower. Is there a motion here? I'd make a motion to approve. I have, I have a question uh -huh. about it. Um, do we have a park naming policy? We do indeed. And so this. It's, if it's criteria, they're fit the criteria. Okay, because it, I mean, it just seemed like it was based on a letter that we received, and it seemed kind of higgledy piggledy. I guess I don't know that it's a technical term for you. You know, it, 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 I don't know. It just, I, I don't know what if we yeah. have not specifically when we did Project 180, mm -hmm. uh, both Colcord and, and Couch Drive used to go between straight through between Hudson and. and, and and Harvey, or a Hudson Walker, and uh, what, we now brought that curve back in and took that out, and so there, we actually created a couple of new areas on, on Hudson, and, and the north uh, portion is named after Carolyn Hills. Carolyn Hill, who was the, the uh, museum director for a number of years, uh, was, did, was named after the Northeast Park, and the, north, the Southeast Park uh, has been requested for Frank Hightower because of the years of the Hightower building. So, uh, so, so how does this, um how does this qualify according to our policy? Um, James, I don't have the policy completely that, written in front of me, but it does have to be, you know, a recognized civic leader. I think we require that it be named after, well, I was going to say someone deceased, but I don't that, think that's, that's, not, that is not, that's part of not completely it. true. But okay. it does go through a screening process, an elaborate screening process at the park. And just by way of a teeny bit of history, um, Frank Hightower, the J stands for Frank Johnson Hightower. The Johnson family came. Oklahoma City in the late 1800s. There were two brothers that came from Mississippi. Um, they um, established the ultimately the first national bank and trust of Oklahoma City. That uh, was founded by the family. They built the Hightower building, um, responsible for um, lots of different institutions in town. The Cellar Restaurant. I think lots of people will remember. Um, going forward to today, we appointed uh, Danny B. Hightower to the Myriad Gardens Foundation. Frank okay. was, is her late husband, and they've just been a major civic leaders in Oklahoma City for many, many years. And so this request came from the family. The park is right outside the Hightower building. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably my um, expectation that it won't be called the Frank J. Hightower Park. It'll just be called Hightower Park right outside of the Hightower building. Okay, so. cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. We're voting on item 8P, and it passed unanimously. Item 8Q is uh, three items that would extend our labor agreements, and uh, we need to vote on these separately. So look for a motion on item 8Q1. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And, and now just, 8Q2. Just to be clear, what we're doing is, is rolling forward the existing contracts until new contracts can be negotiated. Do we have a second on item 8Q2? Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 8Q3. Cast your votes. And it passed unanimously. Item 8R, understand we do not need executive session, so how about a motion to move that one through? Just strike. No, to just strike. Oh, just strike it. Okay, how about the motion to strike? Oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. R, we don't need executive session. We need to approve the resolution. Right, I'm so sorry. we need a motion to approve the resolution on item 8R? Move approve Okay, and it passed unanimously. Item 8S, we can have a motion to strike. We do not need executive session. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8T, uh, let's see, we strike, strike not need, one. so we just need to strike this one. Item 8T is the motion to strike. Cast your votes, and that item is struck. Item 8U, I understand we do need executive session. Yes. The municipal Counselor's Office will update council on the, the um, recent uh, developments on this case, so a motion to move it to executive session. Cast your votes. That item moves to executive session. Item 8V will be struck as there's no need for staff to update the council today. So how about a motion to strike on 8V? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8W is claims recommended for denial. Is there any, anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 8W? All right. How about a motion then to move these claims into 
the denial category and cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item nine is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here hoping to speak or any item listed under item nine? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And the first item from council is uh, to appoint our special judges. And Pete heads up the Judiciary Committee. Pete, you want to say anything about this item? I'm, um, I, I'm very pleased with the list we have. We've, we've, we've consulted with the uh, court administrator who's here and uh, uh, with the presiding judge. And uh, we feel they, they felt a need to expand the pool. We've done that periodically to expand the pool of special judges. Um, and I'm very pleased that, uh, with this list. And uh, I move that the uh, resolution appointing these, these individuals be approved. So, so there are a lot more this year? Is, is yeah, that, well, actually, it, it does seem every, like a long year list. or so, <laughs> we add new names and take people's names off that uh, don't, either don't serve or want to be taken off. And that, this is a rare, fairly routine. This may be about as long a list as I've seen, although Stacy would probably have a better institutional memory about that than I do. But this is a fairly extensive list. So, yeah. is, is it just because for whenever you need a special judge that yeah. you, you have a, a long list of Years people ago, that are we available. had five sitting judges. Now we only uh, have four. And so when we consolidated from five to four, we we started using specials uh, more frequently than we had done in the past. And that has increased the, the workload for the specials. Um, uh, it, it's actually also created a pool of applic applicants when we have judges, when we have judge openings there. There, they get some valuable experience there. And Stacey, if you've got any comments to that. No, it, it is a larger list than we've had at times in the past, but over the past few years, we've had a need for that many people uh, due to illnesses or uh, people needing to be away, judges uh, needing to be away. So it, it uh, definitely meets the need. Mr. May, if I could, uh, this list, uh, is a very, uh, even though it's a, it, it is a larger uh, amount of names, but this list uh, is a very diverse uh, group of people. Just scanning through uh, the names, there are some um, Ward 7 people uh, on this list. So this, this is great. Thank you, Pete. Okay, Pete, you want to make a motion to approve item 10A? I, I, I move the adoption of the resolution. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 10B comes to us from the Legislative Committee, and uh, item 10B and 10C are uh, to put out for advertisement uh, our consulting services at the legislative level, both the state and the federal. And uh, you may remember we had uh, John Montgomery here just a couple of weeks ago who was uh, stepping down after a long uh, line of service for the, on the federal side, and so we expect to have a, a few, perhaps, uh, opportunities to uh, hire people that we hadn't had before. I think John's had that contract so long that people lost interest in, in being part of the, of, of the process. So uh, hopefully we'll get a lot of new names. And of course, uh, our uh, state legislative uh, contract is up as well after a series of one-year contracts. So uh, that has come to us from the legislative committee. Um, I, I'd move uh, approval of uh, both items if I can do it at once. Um, yes, you can, right? Yeah. So we're, um, the motion is for item 10 B and C. Cast your votes. I might add Cash another unanimously. comment um, that, that doesn't have anything to do with the vote, but uh, this is another area that w when we look at this summer at um, at workshop items, I'd like to, the whole idea of, of our legislative program to be talked about in a meeting with all nine of us there in terms of how we go in the future. There was a comment earlier about uh, talking to the legislature about something, that, and I... Uh, uh, it, th this has not been a uh, a pleasing year at the state level, in my view, from what's happened. And I think maybe we need to review, it's kind of like the AA saying about doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results of mark of mental illness. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure we're not about to bid ourselves in that situation because we've done the same thing for so long. And in fact, it's not just that we get the same result. Over the last few years, we've got worse results. And I just, now that's not to say there aren't some bright spots, but 
overall it is not has been disappointing i think and i'd like for us collectively at one of these workshops again this summer to just put this on the topic to talk about for a little bit ok all right um items from council james you have anything for us today ed I'm just going to say one one final thing on Cabela's and then move on. I just I really it's going to be up to the public to bring uh, the kind of abuse and and corporate cronyism that we're seeing come to an end. It's not going to come from I think government. I think it's a, a dangerous set of affairs when corporations are able to push governments around when government bodies are acting out of fear and reactionary policy when we can't have a public discussion either at the Economic Development Trust or today about these policies, legitimate questions that aren't discussed publicly. I think that's, I think that's a frightening set of affairs and I think it's dangerous. And the only change will come from the public. There's only two things that result in political change, organized people and organized money. And if the people uh, don't resist, then you'll, you'll now see a floodgate, I think, of this kind of abuse. I was talking with a good friend last night who just remarked of how the public continues to vote against their interests, who doesn't like this kind of abuse but doesn't do anything. Um, it, uh, would, it would have to be clear to the corporation that it was not in their interest to try and extort or extortion like. Uh, extraction of, of this kind of money, that they would have been better off financially not to ask for the three and a half million. We have to ask ourselves what happened in Greenville, South Carolina, for example, that Cabela's didn't ask for an incentive, they just came in. And ultimately that there, there has to be some displeasure, some uh, protests from the public. And the ultimate protest is where you shop. And so I'd ask that you vote with your pocketbook, that you support local businesses, local businesses that have worked uh, without incentives, without this kind of uh, aid to dependent corporations, this uh, corporate cronyism, and, and, and just free market economics. Support your local businesses. I don't think Cabela's is a friend to Oklahoma City. We asked them for a non-compete, not to build within certain miles. Couldn't even get that, which, which means I would expect that to be likely in the future. So by not, by not shopping at Cabela's and shopping at local businesses, uh, you send a message, uh, not just to Cabela's shareholders, who are somewhat vulnerable this year, even though they've had a wild expansion, they've missed their earnings the last three quarters. If there was organized resistance from a city, and we don't have to do this in isolation, there are multiple cities facing this kind of extortion-like practices. If cities would join together, uh, and resist, you would start to see nervousness from shareholders and pressure from shareholders on the corporation not to engage in these kind of practices. That's the only way it's going to change. I don't think it's going to come from your elected bodies. I don't think it's going to come from government. It has to come from the public. And it really has to be an alliance between both the left and the right. Put the social issues aside, squabble over those later, but a left-right alliance uh, we're, we're all Oklahoma Cityans first. We support our local businesses uh, that are operating without incentives. Thanks. Okay. Larry? Okay, Pete? Just one comment. I noticed today that the press area is full, and uh, uh, I'm sure there hasn't been such a upsurge by the Gazette and the Journal Record and the Oklahoman to quadruple their size of their staff. So. I uh, w welcome the OCCC's uh, journalism students that are upstairs <coughs> watching us today. All right, David. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just a comment, and uh, this past weekend I had the pleasure of going out to Santa Fe and attend the Alan Hauser uh, ceremonies uh, <coughs> celebrating his 100th anniversary of his birth as well as the 100th anniversary of the Cherokawa Apache Indians being released from prison as the entire tribe had been held captive at Fort Sill for 27 years and they were released in 1914. Uh, Allen was the first uh, member of the tribe born uh, to freedom 
uh, upon the uh, tribe's release. And uh, he's got a great story growing up here in Oklahoma in a very difficult time, being born in 1914, would have grown up uh, uh, into the Depression time. Uh, his uh, people around him recognized his artistic talents, were able to uh, get him over to the New Mexico, I don't remember the exact name, the New Mexico uh, School of Art, uh, where he began to develop his skills. Uh, he's a great artist. Uh, the Oklahoma license tag has a, uh, uh, one of his sculptures on it. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, the Oklahoma City Airport currently has two of his sculptures. There's over a hundred of his pieces of artwork throughout the state of Oklahoma this year, uh, the uh, anniversary of, of his birth. And I think we have an opportunity, if we can get some uh, private citizens to work with us, to perhaps acquire one or two of those uh, sculptures currently at the Airport Trust. I think they would be very interested in speaking with us to allow those uh, works of art to stay here on a permanent basis. We just need some private money to help accomplish that. But the Oklahoma City Museum of Art would be uh, very interested in partnering with us to provide uh, the mechanism to accept the donation if we didn't want to do it directly. And, uh, you know, with Airport Trust, well, with the Will Rogers Airport having close to four million travelers a year, it's a great opportunity to uh, show uh, this great artist's uh, artwork and it's a great way to introduce people for the first time when they come to Oklahoma City uh, with this kind of uh, uh, tremendous uh, art. I'm very uh, impressed with all of his works and his life story. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out. Hopefully people can begin talking. We'll generate some interest. Uh, people would want to come forward and uh, work with us in this uh, endeavor to acquire uh, some of uh, his works. Thank you. Yes, Mayor, if I could, just a couple of things. Um, I've now had three months to serve as the council representative on the MAPS uh, oversight committees, and I've had a chance to attend, I think, every um, one of the subcommittee meetings. They don't all meet every month, so um, they rotate around. But I just really wanted to comment on and thank uh, the volunteers serving on those oversight committees and our staff the amount of work that goes in um, behind the scenes on these projects, we're really getting to the most exciting stage where drawings are being done and you know, we're about to see a lot of stuff come out of the ground, but great reports from the senior health and wellness centers, great reports on trails and sidewalks. Um, you know, we're just making so much progress and I don't think our citizens see it every day, so I just want them to really understand how hard our volunteer committees and our staff are working to make sure we deliver um, class A plus projects. Um, I also, um, we talked a little bit about noise today. Boy, there was a lot of noise in downtown Oklahoma City this weekend with the OKC Fest. And I really want to congratulate you, Mayor, and uh, Fred Hall for being able to somehow pull together this three-day festival that we had. Um, there were people all over the grounds, crowds in the, um, on the main, sta main stage, crowds at the Myriad Gardens. There were free events all weekend long down at the Myriad Gardens. Sunday, there was a gospel choir. Sunday afternoon, um, Latin music on the stage. Maureen, I see you're here. You must be exhausted. Um, it was a busy, busy weekend um, at the Myriad Gardens and just great diversity representing all of our community. And I expect this will do nothing but um, grow. Splendor in the Gardens, which was the Myriad Gardens outdoor dinner was held two weeks ago. I think there were over 300 people in attendance, it was just a wonderful event, and my Ward 7 colleague and I got to attend the Urban League Banquet last week as well, which is another very special event for Oklahoma City. So, lots of good things happening. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and congratulations uh, on your new uh, appointment uh, for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, job well done and continue to uh, uh, do great work for uh, the city of Oklahoma City and also U.S. Conference of Mayors. So I do want to take the opportunity to thank the Boathouse uh, Foundation 
This is the second year the Bow House Foundation uh, has hosted uh, the Boy Scouts. Um, uh, this year it was called Thunder on the River where um, Boy Scouts and the uh, uh, Bow House District teamed up and actually allowed inner city youth uh, to take uh, part of a week long, uh, a week long uh, camp right there on the river. So it allowed um, kids who may not have had the opportunity uh, to use some of the um, uh, boathouse um, uh, facilities. And so I, I think it was a very um, excellent uh, camp. And also uh, the sponsors include OG&E, uh, Clay Bennett, and the Oklahoma City uh, Thunder. I think um, uh, putting on those type of uh, camps uh, that allow uh, the underserved population to use those facilities, I think, says says a lot. Mm -hmm. So, again, thank you to the Boathouse Foundation. All right, thanks, Pat. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to follow up on a comment made about our citizens not being fully aware of the progress we've made in maps projects so far. And maybe a presentation to the council, where the presenter was on TV, would be helpful to give us a, a, an idea of where we stand on the various projects, maybe even the financial report is how we're doing for as money is concerned, but uh, to, to make people aware of what's going on. Okay. We can certainly do that. Uh, Councilman Sellers asked that next time we do a, an update on, on the wellness centers, and so that was uh, planned well, for the we, 15th. We, but we, we could do the whole thing, you know, maybe wrap it up in one presentation. I don't, a lot of, a lot of detail wouldn't be necessary, but just sort of a status report on where the projects are. Uh, the second comment is a question I had from a constituent about the city's policy for picking up trees, tree removal branches and things, not necessarily associated with a storm, just with routine maintenance of trees. I've got a couple of constituents who have a big pile of brush in their yards. They're wanting to know if the city will pick it up. I don't, I wasn't sure exactly what our policy was. I'm sorry. Well, our policy is that we'll pick up a certain amount for, at no cost, under big junk pickup. And then beyond that, we, we have a charge for it. But the big junk pickup, as you use your term, that would take care of the tree it, it, up, to a, up to a point and up beyond to a certain, that, to, up to a certain size. Someone has correct. to pay for the removal. That's correct. And what is that amount? I don't, I don't recall. It seems okay. that it's uh, so many cubic yards and then beyond that there's a charge on it. Maybe Marsha. Okay, how does the, the uh, citizen become aware of the fact that he may be charged to remove some tree land? Let's, uh, let's have Marsha come in and talk about that because I deals with that much more than I. While we're waiting on that, can I uh, address one of Councilman Ryan's, uh, his previous comment about having a special program just on the maps? Perhaps it could even be held at a time outside of our normal council meeting, even if we did so, say, in the evening, like at 6.30 or something. Since you mentioned the fact of it being on TV, now I know we can continue to run our shows at any time on TV, but maybe having one in the evening would help draw even more attention to that. Well, perhaps it would, David, and it's something I think we got to consider, but the fact that we are, te this program is televised, I think is a, 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 a valid attempt to reach out to the public to make them aware of what's going on. In fact, the, the representation of the press here, we might you know, be able to get a little bit of a, a back, backing from them as far as making people aware of what we, where we stand on that. It's a, thank you. Okay, looks like Marcia's here. So big junk pickup, you get four cubic yards in a set out. Uh, without charges, we carefully measure if we think the set out is above and take the pictures. volume. And we do take pictures. We make fairly good records of, of that action. Uh, and larger set outs are actually fairly rare, uh, given the total number that we collect. However, back to the point, it's about 8 $9 a cubic yard for the extra, which is our cost for landfilling. Yeah. How do we make the, the citizen aware of the fact that what those costs might be? Sure. We, um, it is actually on, printed on the bill. There's a, a statement about the uh, when bulky waste set out occurs that it's four cubic yards and what that fee is. But I was talking, Marsha, about a specific you know, citizen who had a, you know, a large pile of brush in front of his house that he's trimmed off trees or whatever. And uh, he's going to get four cubic yards hauled away for free. But if, if his pile of brush exceeded four cubic yards, there would be some charge. Yes, the inspectors go through ahead of time. If the bulky waste, if you set up bulky waste when we ask specifically on the schedule that we ask, that gives the inspector time to go through, look for large piles, and leave an estimate for the customer. Okay. So the, the, the citizen does have an opportunity then to review the, decide whether he wants it hauled away or not. 
Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And while, while you're here, Marcia, if you are leaving out tree limbs and they need to be bound, tied up. Uh, no, no longer bound, thank, but thanks for the opportunity oh, really? to talk about that. But, but in just, an organized pile. You can just pile, pile up the, the, the sticks and the, and the long branches. Yes, they always appreciate the, it being a, an or, a more organized pile. That will help you reduce the, what we see as a volume. Okay, I didn't realize we'd change that. But just keep in mind, somebody's got to pick it up. Exactly. So, thank the you. easier you can make it on our staff would be appreciated. I think you. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. Um, city manager reports. Um, we do have on the agenda today our last uh, sales tax and use tax collection report for the year. And so I think it's interesting to point out that if you combine the two, use and sales tax, it's, it's, it's right at $250 million. And it's within a half a million dollars of our estimate, which is 0.2%. And it's our, one, our staff did a really good job of, of, of doing some estimates as we go forward. But it's also interesting to point out that we were underperforming until the last three months of the quarter where, where we had some strong months. And that's exactly what the economist told us at, at, our, at our two previous workshops at the, you know, that the last quarter of our fiscal year or, or, or you know, that it would be April, May, and June of, of, of uh, 14 would be very strong for us. And, and he was, he was a, a correct. And, and so I think he needs to at least be, you know, we, we probably beat him up when he's wrong. So we should at least acknowledge, uh, acknowledge it when he hit one and he was correct on this time. So we're very pleased uh, on the, the dollar amounts, but I'm also pleased on, on, on how well uh, staff projects for sales tax and use tax. All right, on to citizens to be heard. Ask everyone to keep their comments to three minutes or less. Uh, Roy Stafford. Good morning to the mayor, members of the city council. I know that this is inappropriate. No one has to tell me uh, to not follow Robert's rules of order. So I will adorn this. This is me. This is giving poverty a voice. That's a depiction of my head and the word voice coming out of my mouth. Uh, nothing negative this morning. But it might, what I have to say might upset a few people. I wasn't born for nobody to like me. The collective I refer to as a reference to Star Trek. Everyone does what they're told to do and guided to do. Not me. The only person who leads me, guides me, is uh, Almighty God and my significant other of about 32 years, which Mr. Shadid had the pleasure of meeting the other day. Your, your medical associate, I requested of him to call me to explain or to pass along to you to explain to me the procedure because as you know, she had a family emergency that day and suffered from a brain tumor and a whole list of other things. Five specialists, two GPs, now two pain mediation doctors. It just went like this, so I didn't waste my time <clears throat> approaching our councilman for Ward 7 concerning the issue at 23rd Martin Luther King, I got it handled myself. I don't like asking people to do stuff that they know they should do in the first place. Uh, the reason I have my absence, the reason for my absence is I'm not naive enough to think that coworkers will not share with, the, with each other information that uh, would give them a heads up on what I'm going to speak about. And what I'm speaking to is the absence of Mr. Jordan the last time I spoke. I don't break the rules, so I'm not going to go over what I spoke about, but I will make a point of it because perception is everything in God's world, perception. The issue at 23rd Martin Luther King, I know in some board meetings at golf courses, locker rooms, we're referred to as jungle bunnies. Let them live in the jungle. That's what uh, the the property acquisitions person probably was thinking when they had no plans on maintaining the property at 23rd Martin Luther King. Miss Johnson, Connie's mother, Miss Harmon, Betty Harmon's mother, a very successful pediatrician in Oklahoma City who lost her practice facilities in the Moore tornado, and uh, Miss Watson. They drive still in Creston Hills. There's no excuse for them to drive past the, those properties once the properties have changed hands to Esperanza real estate and look the way it looks. I did something about it. Thank you. 
right, we have executive session. We'll be back.